world, good uh, day to you. Welcome to episode four of Sashi Singh's Talking Point, coming live on Facebook from Sydney, Australia. We're waiting for our chief guest to join us. Uh, and today, of course, our chief guest is the former Prime Minister of Fiji and leader of the, Nash- of the Fiji Labour Party, Mr. Mahendra Pal Chaudhry. And uh, Mr. Chaudhry, if you are listening or watching, we've sent you the link. If you could please enter the studio. We uh, hope to be talking to Mr. Chaudhry shortly, and our focus today will be on issues relating to the forthcoming elections in Fiji, and we will also look at the problems and challenges facing the people of Fiji today. Then we meet uh, Fantasha Lockington, the CEO of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, and we will discuss the reopening of the international travel to Fiji, the opening of the borders, and we'll discuss uh, matters in relation to quarantines and hotels in Fiji, and our regular insights on the happenings of the week with uh, Nick Hilsing, former Fiji TV journalist, uh, who will again join us this afternoon, and uh, he will be telling us what's been making the news in Australia. received a message uh, that there's a slight hitch uh, with getting Mr. Chaudhry on. We will endeavor to do that very, very quickly. So please uh, stay with us. Uh, Looking forward to this discussion with the former Prime Minister of Fiji. A number of uh, pertinent matters to be discussed. The focus, as I said, uh, will be on uh, things in Fiji, problems, challenges facing the country, and uh, also looking ahead at uh, elections in 2022. Let me say that uh, this is our fourth episode and uh, I thank the viewers who've uh, joined in from the very first program when we had as our chief guest uh, Graham Everett Leong. The numbers have just uh, grown in terms of the support for Sashi Singh's Talking Point and I thank each and every one of you for being part of this program. And of course, uh, we've uh, touched on uh, domestic violence issues with our uh, interview with Anita uh, Handley. That was uh, an inspiring program. And of course, last weekend, we discussed uh, politics with the leader of the National Federation Party, uh, Professor Biman Prasad. Uh, Hopefully, the glitch can be removed very shortly and our chief guest can join us uh, shortly. So in the meanwhile, I'll try to figure this out very quickly and help Mr. Chaudhry online. Please bear with us. Uh, that's been coming through. Vinay Chan from Sydney says, uh, all ready for another awesome show time. Dr. Subram Naidu says, Bula and Namaste all. Rakesh and Saras Prasad are also joining us this afternoon. They say, Bula everyone. And uh, Vinay Chan says, Bula uncle. Roland Lilo is uh, from Wayavi Lotoka. He says, uh, why heavy something? Let me get this comment up. Uh, just one second. Why heavy online? Well, yes, indeed, uh, Roland. Hopefully, the show can uh, 
get on air very, very quickly. We're trying our best. Uh, this happens with uh, modern technology. Roma Singh, yes, uh, my dear Roma, says, uh, wish you all the best. Dev Chopra, top show today. Well, that's what we have in mind, uh, Dev. And uh, by the way, Dev Chopra is the uh, young man who designs our posters, and he's uh, done such a phenomenal job. It's absolutely amazing. Um, let me see what it says here. Okay. All right, well, uh, five minutes, okay. Well, um, Vince, All right, well, uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, Dev Chopra has designed our posters so far, and Dev, you've done a phenomenal job. Thank you so very much for your support and your kindness. And um, Kapil Dev is also watching uh, this program from Brisbane in Queensland. Anybody else from Fiji watching, I hope uh, you can uh, put some comments on. Mr. Chowdhury's just sent a message. There's a technical hitch. Uh, He's asked us for uh, something like five minutes. Somebody's going to assist him. That's okay. In the meanwhile, uh, all I can say is that uh, sometimes when you look forward to something quite a lot, uh, there's always a glitch in the system. And uh, please bear with me. If you have any questions for me, put your comments on and uh, let me see what I can do to uh, keep you entertained or to answer your questions as well. So uh, we'll get this... Uh, uh, comment uh, section moving as well, and uh, let's see what happens. Uh, Uma Singh from Christchurch says, uh, Ram Ram Namaste and Nisambula everyone. Mr. Chaudhary, welcome. Well, we'll welcome him, him as soon as he gets in. Um, who, who is that, Nikhil? Yes, may as well get Nikhil in. All right, uh, Nikhil, I think it's time... Uh, Young man, I think you better step into the fray and let's not kill time. Let's get uh, the, the Sydney news and things happening uh, very, very quickly as well. So, Nick Hill, if you can jump in, uh, I'll be most grateful. Uh, Janendra Baldeo, good day, Sashi. Yes, uh, Mr. Baldeo, good afternoon to you. Uh, welcome to uh, Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Pushpa Kuni from the Blue Mountains says, Bola and Namaste to all. Shalendra Prasad, Namaste, bye, and all the best, uh, thank you. Reshma Singh is watching this program, says, awesome program, Reshma, we will start shortly. Gurmit Singh is watching, thank you, thank you very much. Labor on the move, Taina Rokotambua. Nisam Bulabnaka Taina, nice to know, welcome to the program. And uh, like I said, there's a slight hitch, and uh, my thoughts are with Mr. Chaudhary. We will get this fixed up. And it's going to be a program worth watching because uh, it's very, very hard to uh, get uh, a politician with you online. And uh, Mr. Chaudhary has agreed, and I'm uh, thankful for that. And like I said, we'll get through that glitch and uh, get that done very, very quickly. Um, yes, uh, Ray Tecker is from uh, Chicago watching as well. Uh, she says, Bula, everyone. Nimbulavnaka says, uh, nice of you to join us. Manjit Singh Chopra says, Nisambulavnaka, everyone. And um, so the program will continue. And at this juncture, let me say you're watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point from Sydney, Australia. And we bring uh, on screen uh, our regular Fiji contributor. Um, well, let me tell you, Dennis Rounds, our regular contributor from Fiji, has uh, reached the UK safely, and hopefully will be with us in the new year. And right now, though, look at him, young and handsome, Nikhil Singh, former Fiji TV journalist, joins us with what's been making the news in Australia. Nikhil, thanks for stepping in. You're a gem. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Sashi. Always uh, good to be with you. Thank you very much, Nikhil. Now, uh, a look at what's been making the news here in Australia. The federal opposition came out last week and made a major policy announcement. It looks like Anthony Albanese is putting climate change front and center of his party's election campaign. But it's the reaction from the business community that took almost everyone by surprise 
What's the deal in that section? What's happening? Well, Sashi, as we had touched on in an earlier episode, the federal opposition had applied relentless pressure on the Morrison government um, in the lead-up to COP26 um, about um, uh, co the coalition's uh, policy uh, on climate change. Now, since then, we did see a plan that was taken to Glasgow by uh, Mr. Morrison, um, and then uh, immediately after, the pressure was somewhat reversed um, with the government then attacking the opposition, given the absence of uh, Labour's policy in this important area. Um, Anthony Albanese has come out uh, with a policy announcement with what he has called uh, the most comprehensive modelling ever undertaken by an opposition. So there was an announcement on Labour's climate policy that they will be taken to the election, and some of the key points of that policy, Shashi, is um, uh, committing to cutting greenhouse gas emissions by 43% by 2030 if it wins government uh, in the next election. Um, the second one is boosting renewables, um, a plan to create more than 600,000 jobs, uh, new jobs, that is, uh, cut power prices by $275 uh, a year per household by 2025, uh, boost private uh, uh, investment. Um, and the costing for the policy is, um, it, it comes out at $683 million. Um, but as you pointed out, the surprise, uh, as you highlighted, um, is the ringing endorsement by uh, the business community, uh, a very unusual ally that Labour has found, uh, traditionally aligned with the Conservatives, major business groups, including the Business Council of Australia, uh, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and in, uh, Industry, and the Australian Industry Group, uh, to name a few, have come out in support of Labor's climate policy. Uh, so I'm, in my view, Labor is setting climate change, uh, the climate change debate as one of their big ticket items to take to the federal election next year. All right. Well, time will tell whether that's the most important item on the agenda for, for people here in Australia. Mm. Now, I have observed something. There has been a rise in independent candidates targeting safe uh, liberal federal seats. What's your take on this, uh, this situation? Uh, certainly, it's actually an interesting trend that appears to be setting in. Um, if I take you back to 2013, uh, when Kathy McGowan made history when she toppled the uh, Liberal frontbencher Minister Sophie Mirabella to become the first independent member for the North East seat, uh, Victorian electorate of Indi, and the first female independent crossbencher. Um, the seat of Indi has since been held by an independent, so since 2013. Uh, and in the last election, we saw another independent, Zali Stegel, taking the fight to the seat of Warringah and creating one of the biggest upsets, defeating former Prime Minister Tony Abbott um, in what has been regarded as uh, a blue ribbon seat for the Liberals. Uh, now, as we head into the federal election mode, we see a lineup of other independents targeting blue ribbon Liberal seats. These include Zoe Daniel, uh, Zoe is no Daniel if, uh, if uh, you, you keep your tab through the media. Zoe is a former ABC journalist who has announced she will be running against Assistant Energy Minister Tim Wilson in the seat of um, Melbourne Bayside. Uh, then we have uh, Kilia Tink. She's out campaigning against Liberal uh, Member of Parliament Trint Zimmerman to win the affluent seat of, of North Sydney. This is a seat that has been held by the Liberals since 1996. This is where Joe Hockey actually made in a, um, an entrance to politics. Um, and if I take you to the seat of Warringah, oh sorry, my apologies, to the, to the seat of Wentworth, um, Liberal backbencher Dave Sharma holds the seat with a very slim margin of just 1.3%. Uh, and we have Allegra Spender, uh, who has declared she will be contesting as an independent. Uh, Allegra, again, uh, a high-profile candidate, the daughter of uh, fashion designer, the late Carla Zampetti. So um, there is a trend being established by the independents targeting safe liberal seats. And if we look at what happened in Indi and Warringah, uh, Morrison, i got to say, will be feeling a little bit uneasy. All right. Well, you mentioned uh, Zali Stegel. 
She's the federal member for Warringah, as you said, uh, a seat she snatched from the Liberal Party. Prime Minister Scott Morrison has been trying very, very hard to convince uh, former New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian to run, hoping her popularity could uh, bring the seat back uh, to the Liberal Party. Is the former Premier going to enter the race? Well, I've got to say, it's actually a disappointment for Morrison, unfortunately. After days of keeping us in suspense, Gladys Berejiklian has come out this week uh, declining the offer to contest. Um, there was a concerted effort by the Liberals for the former New South Wales Premier to contest, um, and this follows some internal party polling, which showed Berejiklian was quite popular in the Warringah electorate uh, and should possibly uh, take a seat back uh, from the independent, but in some latest development, um, uh, this is this is also uh, qu quite quite um, uh, interesting development. Uh, is that we hear Tony Abbott is making some news of a comeback. So the battle for Warringah is going to get very interesting, Sashi. Well, I think we're heading for a very exciting 2022. Now you had shared with us uh, news about Nationals MP George Christian Christensen. Um, being in a bit of uh, bother, a bit of trouble. He was back in the news this week. What has he done now? Certainly, uh, he has been back in the news. Uh, well, George Christensen did not do himself any favours when he appeared uh, in a web series hosted by far-right American conspiracy theorist Alex Jones. Now, Alex is, um, is banned from social media sites, including Facebook, Instagram and YouTube for violating, violating their uh, hate speech policies. Um, in the exchange between uh, Christensen and Jones, uh, Jones had made some uh, comments comparing our COVID-19 quarantine facilities uh, to the Ashwoods concentration camp. Uh, Christian, Christensen played along with that and in fact laughed and joked about it. Um, now this time around, Morrison did come out quite strongly publicly criticizing Christensen for referencing the Holocaust as a trivial and in a trivial and insensitive way, uh, he is retiring from politics, so we won't see George Beck uh, in the federal parliament um, under the new, um, I guess, uh, election uh, when when it's held. But uh, is this the end of the controversial uh, member of parliament? Um, your guess is good as mine, Sashi. Back to you. I don't think so. Well, Nikhil, look, thank you for stepping in uh, very very quickly. That's what a true journalist always does, uh, ready to step in at a, at a moment's notice. You've uh, once again done very nicely. Thank you for your time. Enjoy your Christmas function this afternoon. We'll see you on Sashi Singh's Talking Point next Sunday, Nikhil. Thank you, champion. Well done. Thank you, Sashi. Have a nice day. Well, that was uh, Nikhil Singh, and uh, I believe we um, have uh, Mr. Chaudhry, uh just about ready, and uh, if you just give me a few seconds, we will be in business, I think. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once more to uh, Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Now it's time to meet our chief guest for today, Mr. Mahendra Pal Chaudhry. As stated in the introduction to this program, Mr. Chaudhry, the former Prime Minister of Fiji and the leader of the Fiji Labour Party. Mr. Chaudhry, a very, very good afternoon. Sadhir, namaste to you and uh, welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Uh, you'll, hold on, if you can hear me, sir, you'll have to uh, unmute your microphone. Uh, you are on mute right now. Um, so I, we can see that you're on mute. We can't hear you, but we will shortly, I'm sure.
All right, I think that is okay now. Um, Mr. Chaudhary, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very, very well, indeed. Yes, indeed. Well, I can hear you as well. Thank you very much uh, for joining Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Sadhar, namaste to you and welcome to the program, sir. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for this uh, delay. We had a slight glitch here, but now we are on our way. Once again, thank you very much for inviting me to this program. I'm looking for, I was looking forward to it. All right. Uh, it is so nice to have you along. Um, well, let's uh, begin. And I, I did say in my introduction that our focus today is going to be uh, talking at uh, some of the challenges that uh, lie in Fiji in terms of the uh, public in Fiji, looking at uh, the elections. So let's get straight into uh, the program it's, itself. Um, let's look ahead uh, and uh, perhaps begin this afternoon by looking at the socio-economic challenges uh, that prevails in Fiji. Mr. Chaudhary, what do you see as the main challenges facing the nation today? Well, we have several challenges facing the nation today. Indeed, uh, it, it's uh, challenges everywhere you look. But the major challenges are people-based challenges, uh, poverty, unemployment, high cost of living, a critical shortage of affordable public housing. These are some of the main challenges facing Fiji right now. All right. Well, you've, you've mentioned a, a few things here. Let's uh, look at those specific areas of uh, concern that you've raised. Let's begin with uh, poverty. Um, I recently noted that as uh, somewhere as close to as 50% of Fiji's population are either living in poverty or are on the margins of the poverty line. Mr. Chaudhary, how did things get to this stage? And uh, does the government... Uh, how does the government ha address this chronic state of affairs in Fiji? Well, poverty has been in Fiji uh, for a while. But the sad thing is that uh, the government has failed to arrest the le poverty levels and it has kept on going up. And uh, the root cause of poverty, we've been saying this for a long time, is low wages, which have been deliberately suppressed. You will uh, note from... Uh, uh, our statistics that our national minimum wage is just $2.69 an hour, which is abysmally low, which is only $107 a week, and one just cannot survive in that kind of wages. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's uh, poor wages and very high cost of living. The cost of living is very high. The wages are suppressed. Unemployment is another root cause of uh, poverty. And I must say that uh, poverty is a phenomenon which uh, actually exacerbated after the 1987 coups. We had uh, poverty uh, before, but uh, it wasn't so noticeable. But as uh, economic and social conditions worsened after the coup, because the economy took a big, big hit, and once your economy takes a hit, people suffer. So that's where uh, I would put the origins of uh, these ri rising levels of poverty and high cost of living, because uh, these coups were uh, followed by devaluation of our currency, substantial devaluation of our currency, which made everything uh, very expensive. And unfortunately, uh, the governments uh, did not uh, correct uh, the uh, situation by uh, making necessary adjustments to give relief to the people. Mr. Chaudhary, you mentioned uh, unemployment. Let's look at that for a moment. Uh, that is an area of concern. What are your views in relation to the current uh, unemployment uh, situation in Fiji? And also particularly uh, looking at the youth in Fiji. Well, let's begin with uh, the youth. Youth unemployment is very high indeed. Pre-COVID, official statistics put it at around 23%. But we felt that it was much more than that. And today, I would put it at between 35 to 40% youth unemployment. Now, uh, as I said, that uh, economy which is stagnant, which is not growing, is unable to provide employment opportunities. So unemployment becomes a problem. 
in a stagnant economy, which, which is the case with Fiji right now. Uh, we also have problems of uh, uh, unemployment related to workers uh, from abroad who are taking up local jobs. I refer in particular to the uh, construction industry, where we have hundreds of uh, foreign workers who, are, who have taken up jobs, which normally would be done by, by locals. Uh, and similarly, in terms of uh, uh, contracts, more contracts are, big contracts are given out to foreign firms who bring in their own workers. So this has affected employment uh, in a way, and uh, it has exacerbated the uh, unemployment problem. Now we have uh, graduates here, university graduates, who have been looking for jobs, not for months, but for years now. And uh, it is a very, very sad situation because nothing can be more frustrating for a young man or woman who ha have spent money and time in getting a degree and then finding that that degree is of little use to them because they cannot find a job. Well answered. Now, you mentioned a short while ago the uh, escalation uh, in the cost of living, for instance. Uh, given the lar large percentage of people living in poverty on the margins of uh, the poverty line, how can the average person survive in meeting the high cost of living? Well, they have to make sacrifices. There are stories of people having to live on two meals a day, two simple meals on a day, because they cannot afford a third meal. And that is the effect of life uh, in Fiji in terms of uh, escalating living costs and uh, the incomes of families. They have to prioritize spending. And unfortunately, we find that many families have to uh, make huge sacrifices to keep afloat. So it's a sad situation, but again, related to an economy which is not performing, which is unable to provide opportunities and uh, other uh, economic uh, problems that we have, uh, have exacerbated this situation. You mentioned uh, affordable housing. That comes out of the situation the country finds itself. Now, is there a shortage of affordable housing for the lower income families in Fiji? Indeed, indeed. This has been the case uh, for a long, long time. Now, uh, some 22 to 25% of our people today live in uh, informal settlements or squatter settlements, as, as we call them. And this number has been going up. The government has not been able to provide them uh, uh, social housing. Now, the cost of uh, owning a home here, particularly for people with uh, uh, lower incomes, is uh, very high. They simply cannot, on their wages or salaries, afford to even have a basic home. Uh, so uh, they are forced by circumstances to stay in these settlements because the government has not been able to provide them with an alternative. Now, the Constitution, uh, the 2013 Fiji Constitution, says that land for housing is the responsibility of the government. It is listed as one of the basic rights uh, under the Bill of Rights provisions of the Constitution. But then it's only a paper right. People have been living in these settlements for decades. They were born there. They have become fathers there and grandfathers, and they're still there because of inaction by the government. Okay, well, given the socio-economic challenges uh, that Fiji is currently facing, I think it's timely at this point to ask you for your analysis of the Fijian economy today. Earlier this week, the Attorney General and Minister for Economy described the economy as uh, stable. What is your view of Fiji's economy today, and do you agree that Fiji has a stable economy? Certainly not. Mm -hmm. Our economy today is heavily reliant on uh, overseas loans, on remittances, on uh, 
on grants and budget support from our uh, develop, uh, develop, development partners. So it's a, an economy which really relies on, on borrowings and uh, on grants. And uh, there is very little that, that is the local input into the economy. If, you, uh, if I may give you an example. Please do. Uh, and uh, the decline in our economy actually began in 2019. It's not a post-COVID phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, there were reasons why uh, we are in such a state because the government kept on spending, it kept on borrowing. Our our uh, our deficits were uh, very high because of huge borrowings. And uh, in 2019, a situation where had arisen where we were warned about our debt levels and the unsustainability. Uh, of uh, keeping those debt levels without reducing them. So a 2020-21 budget was slashed by one third, by 33% to cut unnecessary expenditure and to limit borrowing. Now this was a, uh, a warning bell for Fiji that you have spent too much and you have borrowed too much and this is unsustainable and you need to cut back on your borrowings, you need to reduce your debt and cut out unnecessary spending. As a result of this, uh, a lot of uh, people lost their jobs because in the uh, civil service started retrenching and uh, uh, the consequences of a economy which had overnight uh, shrank by one third was, were very, very severe. So the economy is far from stable, and anybody would tell you that. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, uh, we have now immense uh, socioeconomic problems, pe people's problems. We've talked about them, poverty, unemployment, because we've got an economy which cannot deliver, and we need to do something about this. So from what you've just said, I gather that the current government has got it wrong in terms of uh, handling the economy of the country. Would you agree with that? Indeed, because they've been there for the last 15 years, which is the equivalent of uh, something like uh, four terms of, 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 of government, of a government. And they must take a large part of responsibility for the present state of the, uh, of the economy. So um, yes, I, I would say that they followed policies which have resulted in the kind of economy that we have got now. They did not take uh, measures to broaden the economic base. They relied too heavily on tourism. They neglected uh, the rural sector, the agricultural sector, the resource-based sectors, were like forestry, fisheries. And uh, to give you an example, uh, uh, the uh, agricultural sector, the resource-based sector, which at one time contributed some 28 percent to the GDP today is down to something like eight to nine percent. And uh, I was just doing a, a, a comparison between Fiji and Mauritius. I think this is important because uh, at one stage after independence, when you look at Fiji and you look at Mauritius, we have si we have similar economies: sugar, tourism, service sector. And uh, we have similar sort of population mix up. And uh, we were ahead of Mauritius in the earlier years. But today, we are three times behind them, both in terms of per capita income and in terms of GDP. Now, uh, how did this happen? And again, I put this to uh, the instability that uh, we have been facing for the last 34, 35 years after the coup. Every time we have a coup, the economy has a setback, and that setback is substantial. It cannot be corrected overnight. It takes a long time. So we've had, what, three coups from 2000? And you can imagine the effect of those three coups on the economy. And this is why we are in this state. A lot of people want to gloss over this. It is an important factor. We must consider why we are here. At one point in time, we were well ahead of Mauritius. What happened? Something must have happened to put us in this, in this, in this mess. 
And that's how, that's my assessment that we have to blame these political instability which was created by these schools, which of course impacted on our economy, on our social uh, uh, statistics and all that. And uh, we still uh, are an unstable country. Instability has been a root cause of lack of investment in Fiji. Uh, you take, uh, go back to first coup. After that, there was a 1990 constitution, which was a racist constitution. And uh, there was a lot of people who left the country. Investment levels went right down. Fiji did not have, was not regarded as a country which was safe to invest in. So there was very low investment. That was corrected by the promulgation of 1997 constitution. But then they didn't let that constitution operate. An election after that, when Labour Party got into government in 1999, uh, there was a coup in 2000. And then again, as we were getting up and moving forward, we were pulled back again. In and 2006. Then, then comes 2006. So how do you expect the economy to really take off or get, or get moving? And this is the cause of the problems that our ordinary men and women face. The villager, the farmer, the, the ordinary worker, they are paying the price for this. They're paying the price for this. Other people, it's, it's not a difficult equation to solve. It's very clear. So we have to okay. do something about this. We cannot, and, and, and the pity of all this is that the people who do this, uh, they get immunity under the constitution. They are not punished. So it keeps on happening and uh, we keep on suffering. All right. Now, Mr. Chotra, with the greatest of respect to you, may I just suggest if you could perhaps um, move a little closer? Um, unfortunately, uh, you're getting cut, uh, you're, you're that's a bit better. Yes, indeed, sir. Um, that's much, much better. What you've just done, you've pulled, I think you've pulled your laptop towards you. Fantastic. Yes. Wonderful. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest today is Mr. Mahendra Chowdhury, former Prime Minister of Fiji and leader of the Fiji Labour Party. That's fine there, Mr. Chowdhury. I think uh, we could live with that. Uh, um, yes, I think. Oh, yes, we'll adjust that uh, from your side. Uh, that should Is do, I think. That's right. okay, I think, sir. Well, it's interesting. You mentioned the agricultural sector. Let's look at uh, uh, the sugar industry. For a very long time, the sugar industry was the strength of Fiji's economy. Now, as of late, there has been so many issues surrounding the sugar industry what, in your opinion, what are some of the chronic problems facing the sugar industry today? There are a number of issues, actually. Uh, let me begin with uh, the problems associated with the uh, uh, renewal of land leases. This has been a, a, a perennial problem uh, with the farmers. Uh, they have uh, uh, difficulties when leases come up for renewal. Demands are made, which they are unable to meet, and... Uh, some of them decide to exit the industry. Others have to borrow to get the leases renewed and they remain in debt. So uh, that's one. The second is the uh, rising cost of production, of cultivation, of uh, harvesting and transportation of cane to the mills. This has been going up, whereas the price of cane, of sugar uh, cane has, has not really uh, moved up. Uh, correspondingly. The third is, uh, of course, milling inefficiencies. The mills are very old and uh, uh, there, is a lot, there are a lot of breakdowns uh, which, uh, of course, reflect on the, uh, on the efficiency of the industry. And uh, returns are poor. So as a result of this, over the years, uh, particularly in the last 15 years, the industry has shrunk by something like 50%. In 2006, just before the takeover by Prime Minister Bani Marama, we produced 3,000, uh, sorry, 3.3 million tons of cane and made 
over 300,000 tons of sugar. Now, this year, we uh, harvested only just 1.6 million tons of cane and uh, made only 120,000 tons of sugar. So you can see uh, the, the, the massive decline uh, that the industry has undergone. And these are the problems which I've I, I, I mentioned. Uh, one of the sad things here is that uh, the government hasn't listened to farmers' organizations. What it has done is that it has completely marginalized them from the industry. The Sugar Industry Act, which uh, was passed in 1984 under Ratumara's government, uh, provided for the uh, a tripartite arrangement in the sugar industry with the growers, the millers, and the government as partners. But uh, sadly, uh, Prime Minister Bani Marama decided in 2010 to dismantle, the, dismantle these institutions where the farmers had a voice. So from 2010, farmers have had no say at all in the running of the industry. And mind you, they are 70% owners of the industry because they supply the raw materials to the industry. So there's a lot of frustration there and repeated uh, representations made to the government have not been acknowledged or uh, responded to. They just don't want to listen to anybody and they're carrying on in their own fashion and look at what they have done to the industry. They have reduced its size by 50 to 60%. And if it continues like this, I'm afraid in the, next, in the next three to four years, you might see the industry disappear altogether. We've lost the Penang mill in Rakiraki. That was very important for the people of Ra and for the economy of Ra. But the government didn't care about that. And uh, now they're saying that uh, only one mill will be sufficient for the whole of Viti level. Farmers are very, very worried about this because two mills now, Lotoka and Bar Mill, cannot cope with the cane that is produced today. How will one mill take care of that? These are factors which, is, which are actually uh, of uh, great concern to the farmers. And as a result, there may be more of them uh, exiting the industry, which will be very sad indeed, because uh, already we are feeling the effects of this contraction of the industry in, uh, in the figures of rural poverty. Rural poverty has risen. Uh, you know, in the recent years. And one of the root causes of that is the, the huge decline in the sugar industry. It is indeed a sad state of affairs because in many countries, the, the backbone of the country is the agricultural sector, which actually feeds its people. And uh, looking at what you've just said, or rather listening to you, do you think that an over-reliance and concentration on tourism has contributed to the neglect of the productive sectors in Fiji, uh, in Fiji's economy. And, and yes, uh, if I may add, uh, what role has COVID-19 played in this? Well, I think COVID-19 has brought it out, you know, uh, and, and given us the reality of the situation, that uh, we were depending too much on tourism. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, reliance that... Uh, that kind of heavy reliance on just one sector of the economy, tourism, was going to be, of course, uh, disastrous in the event something happened to that industry. Uh, the Bani Marama government did not move to diversify our economic base. This base was much wider uh, after independence, right up to, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, to the mid 80s or 90s. Uh, our agriculture was doing all right, our sugar was doing all right, and uh, we, our exports were doing well, uh, of course. But uh, since uh, the advent of the Yavani Rama government, we've seen that there has been uh, too much uh, uh, reliance on tourism. Investments uh, have largely favored that sector in terms of infrastructure development and all that, whilst neglecting the rural sector. And uh, as a result, we've had this uh, outflow of uh, rural people from their uh, farms and villages and settlements to urban areas. And the mushrooming of these uh, squatter settlements in the urban areas 
these people are here looking for jobs which are not not there and uh, it's uh, if the government had continued uh, to uh, uh, support agriculture and had carried on uh, supporting rural development we might not be facing this situation today now mr chaudhry still sorry uh, you were saying something i said so uh, the uh, uh, the rural sector can play a uh, huge role in the economy of Fiji because uh, we have forestry, we have fisheries, uh, mining, and uh, uh, of course sugar and uh, other forms of uh, agricultural produce. This should be encouraged. But even now, for for a while after uh, the borders were closed and the tourists were not coming in, there was a lot of emphasis placed by this government on. All right, we're going back to agriculture and all that. But the moment uh, we've heard of uh, borders being reopened, that enthusiasm seems to have waned somewhat. I hope that, uh, you know, uh, that will not happen and that we will continue to uh, now uh, give importance to agriculture. Still staying on the discussion uh, on the economy, let me raise the issue of uh, Fiji's current debt situation. Early Earlier this week, you called for a, and I quote, vigilance in relation to borrowing from foreign countries. Firstly, what did you mean by this statement? And secondly, do you think Fiji's current debt levels are sustainable? Well, they certainly are not sustainable. It's, it's, a, it's a, a cause for great concern. And international financial institutions have been warning us about that. Uh, actually, uh, uh, so I wouldn't say that uh, the debts are at sustainable level. Are you able to see me there, or uh, you, 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 am I on you the screen? To, All right. Yeah, if you could just move a little bit to be on the center screen, that's better. Absolutely, oh. that is fantastic. Okay. Now, whatever you yes. do, please don't don't move for the rest of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, so. Uh, we were talking about the debt levels, whether they're yes. sustainable, and uh, what did you mean by that statement when you said vigilance in relation to borrowing from foreign countries? Yes, uh, indeed. We have to uh, uh, look at the long-term effect of our uh, borrowing. Uh, who are we borrowing from? And... Uh, uh, are there any risks, downside risks, from borrowing uh, from these countries? Now, uh, uh, there are examples of countries uh, which uh, have uh, had their uh, national sovereignty compromised because they borrowed too much from certain countries, which then uh, uh, dict started dictating to them. And uh, therefore, our sovereignty is at risk if we do not give uh, uh, consideration to these facts. Uh, I don't want to mention the countries and uh, mm -hmm. uh, name the countries, but I think uh, the message is getting through. Now, recently, we also have uh, had uh, uh, budget support from Australia and New Zealand. First time in the history of Fiji, uh, we've had to rely on budget support uh, from a foreign government. Uh, whilst I welcome this, I think we need to be cautious. We need to uh, see that uh, there are no strings attached to this kind of support. That's what I meant, that there are no strings okay. attached. Of course, these strings will not be made known to the people, and they will be there. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the, uh, my concern, that if we borrow uh, from these people or we uh, seek favors from, from them, then we must get, it must not come at a cost uh, to national sovereignty. And uh, in terms of debt levels, of course, the sad part about it is that we'll have to borrow more to keep afloat. This is the kind of situation we find ourselves in today. And we'll continue to borrow for some time. Now, uh, the finance minister says that there's a lot of cheap money out there. Uh, so uh, we can borrow smartly. <laughs> and. Uh, the fact is that borrowing is borrowing. There is no such thing as smart borrowing. You've got to pay it back. And uh, 
uh, there are these risks associated with it, yes. Indeed, and as you said, everything comes at a price. Uh, and uh, what that price is at the end of the day, sometimes uh, the average Joe blog does not know. Now, Mr. Chowdhury, do you see any regional disparities in economic development policies? Yes, indeed. Uh, again, I have to go back. Uh, you know, at, uh, soon after independence, the British left a structure here for development. Uh, we used to have uh, district development committees, divisional development committees, and then, of course, the National Planning Office. And in, on developmental issues, uh, these committees were elected by the people, the district development committees and, and divisional development committees. And they made an input into the development of their respective regions. And then this was factored into the national budget, uh, depending on what could, be, uh, what could be made available. Now, these structures were all, over, over time, uh, demolished. So there is very little people's input now, particularly uh, people in the rural sector. And uh, of course, those who are not in positions of influence, they have very little say in the kind of development that takes place. Under Bainimarama government, there's no consultation at all. They make a, uh, uh, some kind of a uh, uh, public consultation, which they say, a meeting with groups of people and all that. And, and then, of course, uh, they put out a national budget. But the people that they meet with are generally people with influence, who, are, who have institutions of their own, who are able to represent their interests uh, uh, to uh, the finance ministry. There is absolutely no voice of the ordinary Joe Blow there. So uh, inclusive, uh, inclusivity is not there in development planning. Now, again, we have poor provinces in Fiji. We have rich provinces in Fiji. There are, if you look at uh, uh, the north, particularly, very little investment has taken place in north. And this is a very tragic uh, uh, situation because Vanua Levu is now being depopulated. There are much less people now living in Vanua Levu than they were 10 years ago. They are all coming into Aviti level because of lack of development in the north. I'm just citing one. There are other areas also. We have very beautiful islands like the Vuni, uh, Ovalau, Koro, which have development potential in agriculture, uh, in fisheries, in forestry. But no. Nothing is being done. If you look at roads on Tabiuni, you wouldn't want to uh, drive your car for fear of having an accident. And people there have been crying out for their roads to be fixed, to make them motorable, to make them safe, at least to make them safe. Nothing has happened. And this is going back when three, four decades. So there is this kind of uneven development. If they do not have the uh, required infrastructure, certainly the development uh, is affected and they remain there. Uh, they are unable to have uh, job opportunities for the children uh, who are educated and grow up there. And because of the lack of these opportunities, they migrate to Viti Lebu. If you go to Vanua Lebu today, very few young men and women you will find who are employed in uh, jobs other than in the civil service or probably in shops and things like that. The rest of them are in Suva. So this is the kind of uh, uneven development which has taken place. The government has not invested in a number of areas where they should have. And uh, uh, this is why uh, these are backward regions, as I call them. On Facebook Live this afternoon, you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point and our chief guest today is Mr. Mahendra Chowdhury, former Fiji Prime Minister and leader of the Fiji Labour Party. Mr. Chowdhury, I would now like to raise the subject of rights, and uh, in particular, human rights uh, and workers' rights in, in, in the country. There was a time when the trade union movement was very strong in Fiji. 
you've been a trade unionist, and the union movement fought for workers' rights. What is the status of trade unions in Fiji at this current point in time? And uh, what is the status in terms of workers' rights? Well, it's a sad situation because uh, trade unions became the first target of the Bandimarama regime after the 2009, after the 2000, 2009 abrogation of the 1997 constitution. When the constitution was abrogated, uh, trade unions were targeted. And over the period of time, their rights were, were diluted, workers were intimidated, trade union uh, officials were uh, harassed, were intimidated. And the general idea was to, uh, to weaken the trade unions uh, to a point where it would become uh, irrelevant. The first target was the National Farmers Union, and I was General Secretary and still am General Secretary of the National Farmers Union. When in 2010, as a result of a government directive, the Fiji Sugar Corporation stopped the deductions of uh, membership subscription. The whole idea was to cripple the uh, union financially and so that they would have to close shop. These were the kind of tactics employed by uh, the government to weaken the trade union movement. Then, of course, they made changes to the legislation, which took away the rights, uh, collective bargaining and uh, freedom of association. All these rights were diluted. In many cases, this was taken away by uh, 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 legislation. Of course, the unions fought back and they were able in some uh, ways to uh, succeeded in some ways to get these uh, such uh, draconian legislation either amended or removed altogether. But uh, the situation is that no, the union movement is under constant attack. Now, one other thing they did, and this is, uh, they've declared that the, in the constitution and in the electoral uh, legislation, that trade union officials, trade union employees uh, are, in fact, public officers. They've been classified as public officers, so they cannot take part in politics. They cannot fight an election. They cannot be officials of a political party. And uh, this is ridiculous. It is a flagrant violation of their civil and political rights. How can one classify a trade unionist as a public officer? He or she is not paid from public funds, paid from the members' funds. Yes. So how how is this definition? How does this definition of a public officer fit a trade union? And I'm quite, uh, this is again, was a deliberate act. So that unions are kept out of politics. They don't get uh, a political voice. So this is a deliberate uh, strategy of the Bani Marama government to, uh, in fact, it is it applies to all democratic institutions. They don't want democratic institutions of the people to exist. That's what they've done. We don't have elections in the local government. All our municipalities are run by nominated people, nominated by the government. And provincial councils also, before they used to elect their own representatives. We don't, we don't have that. And uh, this is the situation that uh, this government does not simply want democratic institutions of the people to function. So now uh, you, sorry, go on. So that's the situation with regard to trade unions and uh, yeah. You mentioned right at the outset uh, about the um, minimum wage, uh, uh, $2.68 or two sixty nine, as you mentioned, per hour. Given the high cost of living that we discussed at the beginning of the program, how is this sustainable? I mean, what are your views on the national minimum wage uh, rates currently in place? Does the set minimum wage impinge on workers' rights? Absolutely. It, it's a shame, actually. Uh, this government should be ashamed of, uh, of uh, the minimum wage that it has set. It only... It, it earns 
a worker, if he or she is on the national minimum wage, under seven dollars a week. Now you tell me how can one, a family, survive on hundred seven dollars a week, bearing in mind the high cost of living in Fiji. Mm -hmm. Now wages were deliberately suppressed. Even recommendations by the wages councils for increases to wage rates were being suppressed by the government, either by way of not acting on it or by way of reducing the recommended rates. Now, Father Kevin Barr, the late Father Kevin Barr, who was uh, the chairman of the wages councils for a long time, he resigned because of frustration over this issue. The recommendations of the council were delayed or amended by the government. And uh, he tried his best, but then it came to a point where he simply gave up and he resigned because of this. These uh, rates haven't gone up for some time now, the minimum wage rate. And, uh, you know, when you look at this, and then you look at what our politicians are getting, <laughs> you look at what our ministers are getting in relation to that. The prime minister is paid a salary of something like $327,000 a year. This is basic pay. Forget about the perks mm. that he enjoys, perks of office. But that's almost $1,000 a day. $1,000 a day. Ministers are getting around quarter million dollars. Senior civil servants are getting also around that, that figure. Now, how do you justify this? How do you justify? It's a moral issue. What kind of leadership is this? That is, you know, it's, it's like stealing from the people. Because the last act of uh, the Bani Marama administration before the election, uh, before the uh, resumption of parliament, was to fix their own pay levels. To fix their own pay levels. So they fixed Please. their own pay levels mm -hmm. <laughs> at that uh, astronomical, you know, uh, level. But they never looked at the people down below. They never looked at the people down below. These are so, very, uh, very pertinent questions indeed. And uh, uh, I, I would like to uh, state at this point uh, to our viewers that I've uh, invited the Attorney General uh, to uh, appear on the program to address some pertinent questions, and uh, Mr. Chowdhury is uh, also firing some very pertinent questions. So my invitation stands uh, to to the uh, Fiji First Party, to the Attorney General, to uh, come forward uh, on behalf of the government and answer some uh, pertinent questions that's going to be put to, to you. Mr. Chowdhury, you said, let's look at the workers below. Um, I now turn my attention to the Fiji National Provident Fund. It was set up to safeguard uh, workers' retirement funds. Figures released by the FNPF last week suggested that some 58,700 members of the fund have zero balances. What are your views on this very, very sorry statistic? Yes, indeed. Uh, this is a sorry affair, a sorry affair, actually. Uh, this government has emptied the retirement funds of the ordinary workers. But before I go on to that, let me also say that our politicians are, are amassing huge sums of money there because of their high pay and their contribution uh, to the Provident Fund. They will have really gorgeous retirement when they, when they leave political office because of the amount they have a mess there. As for the ordinary men and women who are members of the fund, they have been forced to withdraw their own retirement money to survive in times of difficulty, either it be uh, cyclones, floods, or COVID. Now, uh, some 140,000 workers, members of the fund, had to dip into their own savings and withdraw $190 million wow. to keep afloat. That's a lot of money in terms of our economy. 
temporary one. Instead of the government giving them assistance, helping them out, they push the burden onto the people who are already down, down and out. Now you take care of yourselves. We haven't got the money, so you've got some money tucked away in your retirement fund. You withdraw that and, 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 and make do with that. Of course, later on, they gave some supplementation and all that. But that is no excuse for forcing the people to withdraw their own savings, particularly those who can least afford to do so because they'll have nothing left for retirement. This is the situation that they're facing. And uh, my view here is that this money must be paid back to the workers. Mm -hmm. Yes. It must be paid back to the workers because, you know, otherwise you, you, you are stealing from them. You're stealing from them. And uh, surely this matter should be taken up very seriously uh, by the opposition political party, that this money must go back to the accounts of those from which the government has forced them to withdraw. Only then they can, they can have something. But there is more to this. There is more to this. Because this government, in 2012, reduced the retirement benefits, which were then payable. They halved the rate of pension from 15% to 7%, which in itself meant you know, uh, a huge reduction in the final pension benefits of, uh, of the people who will be retiring at age 55 or whatever. So they have uh, done that. Uh, and uh, uh, somehow or the other, this must be made uh, to be paid back. People who have lost their pension benefits, who had it reduced, must be compensated in some measure or the other. I think that is only right, and any future government must look at it seriously. Okay, I think it's uh, time now to discuss uh, issues of governance. Uh, it is important. Uh, a hallmark of uh, good governance is accountability and transparency. Just this week, the Attorney General and Minister for Economy in Fiji exercised his powers conferred upon him by the Audit Act 1969 to grant the Energy Fiji Limited an exemption from being audited, audited by the Auditor General. This exemption also got very quickly gazetted uh, as a regulation. Now, given this current example, do you think, Mr. Chaudhry, there is a complete lack of accountability and uh, transparency in the functions of the current government? Well, we've been complaining about this for a long time, that there is a lack of accountability and transparency. And this is one of the root causes why there is so much corruption in the country. Now, uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, this particular amendment, of course, uh, the uh, EFL is being privatized, mm -hmm. as you know. We've got a Japanese consortium, which has now taken 20% uh, uh, of the shares. And the, the, uh, I think the agenda of the uh, uh, Fiji First government is to further privatize uh, EFL. Now, I cannot understand why this is being done, because EFL is one of the few state-owned enterprises which is well-managed and which has returned good, uh, good profits. It has been making profits in the vicinity of 60 to 70 million a year. It has been paying it, its debts on time, and it has got a pretty healthy balance sheet. Now, why would you want to sell that? Mm. They've sold that and used the proceeds. We don't know where the proceeds have been used, actually, to use for operating expenses of the government. It certainly hadn't been used to reduce the debt. But uh, this is the sort of policy that they're, they're, they're uh, following in terms of public enterprises, uh, I would just say that uh, a public enterprise which is doing well, which is making profits of, and which belongs to the people, should be allowed to continue. Because once in private hands, the cost of these utilities, the char utility charges will definitely go up because there will be people on the board who will be uh, concentrating more on the 
returns to the shareholder rather than uh, the uh, uh, having a, a, a tariff which uh, is fair to both the organization as well as the, uh, the consumers. Um, so I don't know why this has been done. Maybe uh, we don't know who the new auditors would be, that uh, they, haven't, they haven't been named. And uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens here next. But All going right. back to your question of transparency and accountability. Yes. Uh, the the, the uh, Auditor General's reports over the years uh, are uh, very, very uh, clear on this. There are queries of, uh, of uh, uh, co contraventions of financial regulations, of financial uh, practices and procedures, which have not been dealt with. People have got away with millions of dollars of public money. Uh, reports have been made about this, uh, and uh, uh, no one has been taken to task. I myself personally have reported two or three matters. One was, of course, in the sugar industry, where an individual actually got away with millions of dollars uh, and uh, nothing was done. These letters were sent to the prime minister. It wasn't uh, even responded to. Now, this is the sort of thing because they don't think that they're accountable to anybody. This is how this government operates. We are there. We are the authority. You don't have a right to question us. We'll do as we please. That's how I would sum it up. And that's why you don't have accountability or transparency. And that leads to, of course, corruption in government. Which brings me to my very next point. You've just mentioned corruption. A recent study uh, revealed that uh, two out of three persons, two out of three people in Fiji believe that uh, corruption exists in government. Why do you think uh, there is such high levels of corruption in, in the government? It's because government doesn't want to do anything about it. <laughs> I think it's uh, it suits them fine to have a situation like this. We've got provision in the constitution for legislating a code of conduct for holders of high public office. There's provision there for enacting a freedom of information legislation. There is provision in there for the appointment of a uh, transparency and accountability commission. Now, all these three have not been done. That constitution and, uh, uh, imposed on the people of Fiji in 2013 is now 80 years old. But these three very important provisions of good governance have not been enacted, have not been acted upon. What do you surmise from that? What do you surmise from that? Why are these legis legislations, which are mandated by the Constitution, which are good governance legislation, keeping a tab on things, why are they not being enacted? Well, that one give would... you the answer that the government doesn't want to have any checks and balances. Uh, that's, that's how I see it. Well, I was just going to say, um, you know, uh, establishing institutions of uh, that nature uh, only brings the, the truth out. And, um, you know, powers that be, uh, they know the reasons why uh, those institutions are not set up. Now, one of my favorite subjects uh, is the next topic for discussion. That is the concept of uh, democracy. Firstly, do you feel, Mr. Chaudhry, there is a climate of uh, apprehension and fear in the country amongst the ordinary Fiji citizens? Yes, there is, and that it has been there for since 2006. Yes. Uh, okay. Now, uh, what about parliamentary rights and privileges? Do you think the principles of democracy is still alive and well in Fiji's parliament? Absolutely not. The parliament uh, has become, you know, uh, it's like a board of directors meeting. It's uh, pre-debate is just not, is not there. They have amended the standing orders of parliament to uh, make it uh, uh, simply a, 
a uh, kind of a forum where everything is decided within minutes. Mm. We have a standing order for legislation which is urgent and which needs to be passed urgently. That order is being used to actually pass all kinds of legislation, whether they be urgent or not. Everything must be decided within one day. And now the parliament, the sitting time of parliament has been reduced uh, by half compared to uh, what was happening previously. So we just have very short sittings of parliament and the business is conducted as if uh, parliament is a, is, is a board of directors meeting. We have to get through certain things and make, make certain decisions. They will be taken care of in the minimum of time free debate will not be allowed. Uh, and uh, this is how it is. These complaints have been there. So uh, yes, uh, no, uh, parliament is by no means uh, conducted in a democratic fashion. Uh, as I said earlier, that they don't want a, a, a democracy, uh, democratic uh, institutions to function. Uh, so uh, parliament is a victim of that policy as well. Thank you. Now, let us talk about the 2022 elections and uh, electoral issues, Mr. Chaudhry. There have been a number of amendments to the Electoral and Political Parties Act, which some see as undermining the rights of political parties and candidates alike. What are your views on these amendments? We have made representations on these amendments. We have we've opposed them, particularly those uh, that are... Uh, uh, seen as uh, uh, giving extraordinary powers to the Electoral Commission, removing the rights of the people to appeal against the decisions of the Registrar of Political Parties uh, in the High Court. Uh, this was a recent uh, 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 amendment. This right of appeal against the decision uh, was removed from the legislation, and now uh, anyone who is aggrieved as a result of uh, that de decision of the registrar has to appeal to the uh, the uh, electoral commission. Now, electoral commission is not independent of the uh, supervisor of elections or the registrar of political parties, because the registrar of political parties, in his capacity as supervisor of elections, also is the secretary to the commission. So uh, you cannot say that we will be appealing to an independent institution. There's absolutely no reason why. Hello. Uh, I think we've uh, probably just lost Mr. Chaudhry. Um, or it's frozen, uh, if you can have a look, son. Uh, uh, we'll try to get Mr. Chaudhry back uh, we were just going to discuss a number of uh, electoral issues as well and uh, uh, try to get him back. Uh, perhaps if you could send him a message. Uh, let's not just remove that. Can we refresh that? Uh, um, we'll come back in just a moment. Uh, please bear with us. And uh, hopefully we'll get Mr. Chaudhry in just a moment. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, originating out of Sydney, Australia. There's been a number of uh, comments coming. I have a set of questions to ask Mr. Chaudhry. He was uh, pressed for time, but he has uh, quite willingly uh, agreed to uh, come forward and uh, to be part of this uh, program. And uh, uh, some of these uh, comments, uh, the questions that you've raised, uh, in terms of elections or the supervisor of elections, I will be asking Mr. Chaudhry those questions as well. And uh, very, very shortly, uh, 
as soon as we finish our interview with Mr. Chaudhry, uh, we will be speaking with uh, our next guest, and that is uh, Fantasha Lockington, who will discuss tourism and quarantines and a number of things uh, since the opening of the borders to, to Fiji. So um, just bear with me. We will uh, uh, continue this with Mr. Chaudhry shortly and uh, then uh, wrap that up and uh, continue with the rest of the program. Uh, hopefully, I'll be back with you very shortly. Modern technology at its best, uh, there's some internet problems, uh, so we'll try and get Mr. Chaudhry back, uh, quite an interesting discussion I was having with Mr. Chaudhry, uh, but uh, we move on to our next uh, guest, and uh, son, you keep trying Mr. Chaudhry, see if you can get him back. As most of you know uh, by now, Fiji opened up its uh, international borders on the 1st of December 2021. To many in the country, this is a welcome, welcome relief. The sounds of bulla has been emanating in Fiji. And it's now time to meet uh, Fantasha Lockington, the CEO of the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association, uh, who will tell us a lot more about tourism and the hotel industry in recovery mode. Fantasha Lockington, Nissan Bulavinaka, and welcome to Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Bulavinaka Sashi. Nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. Uh, you've accepted our invitation. I'm most grateful and I'm so sorry to have kept you waiting. We've had a few glitches uh, with the connection from Fiji, but uh, wonderful to have you uh, as, as our guest. Well, finally, the borders have opened. International flights to Fiji have resumed from the 1st of December 2020. What has the opening of borders meant for the tourism sector? Well, Sashi, let me start with um, uh, putting a few things into context, um, you know, who the Fiji Hotel and Tourism uh, Association is for starters. Sure. We are a private sector uh, organization. We're funded through our subscriptions from our accommodation providers, hotels and resorts, uh, through dive and marine operators, uh, activities, uh, suppliers to the tourism industry, basically. Um, as, as a a point of difference, Tourism Fiji, on the other hand, is the National Tourism Office and um, is Fiji's destination marketing arm for the Ministry of Tourism. Mm -hmm. We work on behalf of our industry members uh, to address um, thing, you know, anomalies, imbalances in regulatory compliance and uh, legislative frameworks, especially focusing on areas that limit or restrain any sort of business development and growth in tourism. Um, as an example, we have worked tirelessly in the last five years to have government review the 25% taxes um, that is only imposed on the tourism businesses. So it's taken COVID um, to drive home how restrictive this has been for tourism as an industry in Fiji. So finally, yes, the borders have opened. Uh, international flights to Fiji have resumed from the 1st of December. 
What has this meant for the tourism sector? Well, it's meant many, many things to a very diverse industry that by its nature has very far-reaching ripple effects throughout our 333 islands. The first and more obvious one, obviously, is that um, every tourism business has been able to reopen. Even in the lead up to the reopening, it's meant that contractors, builders, suppliers of food and beverages, landscapers, uniform providers, cleaners, and even IT people amongst others have been rehired for their services. So that everything that we do in tourism, you know, has been spruced up and looking great. Uh, we were preparing for this first of December opening for a long time. And keep in mind that even if some hotels were open, um, they didn't make all their rooms available. And even if they were able to, they might only have been open intermittently. So weekends and public holidays only to cater for the very small uh, and very limited local market. Then it's meant that we've been able to move to rehiring of more staff within the industry. Uh, tourism, both directly and indirectly, uh, employs 150,000 people in Fiji. Can you... Yeah, so it's quite a lot. Uh, so as you prepare your business to cater for more customers, you rehire more staff. And staff that have been on reduced hours or have been furloughed, they've been able to be brought back to full hours. If you're a supplier to the industry, a taxi driver, a transport company, if you're in the restaurant or coffee shop business, you know that tourism's multiplier effect means that your business that relies on tourism spillover, it's now going to be buzzing. So you're now prepared to put in the longer hours and you can bring on more staff. Um, also, if you're a fresh uh, produce supplier, your orders have probably just gone through the roof, uh, you know, since the last 20 months. And that includes our local meat producers, our fresh fruit and vegetable providers, our locally produced water even. Um, even the fresh coconut suppliers along the roadside, you know, they've gotten a new lease of life on their trade. All right. Well, uh, it seems that uh, there's a positive vibe in the country and uh, there's a spin-off effect uh, right down the chain just because uh, of the opening of the borders. Now, Fantasha, um, how bad a situation was it during COVID-19 lockdown in so far as the tourism and hotel industry was concerned? Well, Sashi, if you've ever seen 11 or more large Fiji Airways aircraft sitting quietly on the airport tarmac, or you've seen the Nanting International Airport closed with all its lights off and the absence of the usual hustle and bustle and, you know, any noise that is usually made in an international airport, mm. you would begin to see just how eerie it was to simply see everything come to a quiet standstill. You know, of those 150,000 workers, um, they're workers from the airports and hotels, uh, large and small crews and ferry vessels. All of these people went home and large buses got parked, vessels got anchored safely at their berth, hotels shut down. And when this happened, even the small and medium uh, enterprises or SMEs, they were also eventually impacted. Entertainers and musicians at hotels, weavers and dancers, handicraft and farm producers, Fishermen sold less fish and crabs, and that multiply effect on tourism simply rippled right across the economy with less money circulating. So government mm -hmm. um, put in some uh, initiatives that followed this to pump money into the economy. Um, this was access to the lower interest loans for businesses. Um, they allowed workers to access the F and PF. There wasn't anything else they could do. And direct funds to those people who had lost their jobs. And, you know, as Fijians, we're all about laughter and noise and meeting people and meeting our family. And suddenly we couldn't do any of those things because to do so, we could kill family members, as we all learned so very painfully. But I have to say the other side of what it is to grow up in Fiji kicked in, what we call velo money. Mm -hmm. Everyone that could pitched in to make sure that thousands of our families who usually live on daily or weekly wages were supported with food packs or food supplies of some sort. And from around the world, our families and friends sent even more money home. Fiji has always had high annual remittances. Tourism is Fiji's highest foreign exchange earn at over 3 billion annually. But the next level is our remittances that move from an average 300 to 500 million annually to 800 million during these last 20 months. We're also blessed to have so much arable land available and we've got an abundant and very accessible ocean. So food resourcing became what people without jobs turned to. 
So here we are 20 plus months later, around 92% of our um, people are fully vaccinated and we are fighting hard to get back our lives. All right, now there seems to be some confusion, at least on this end, as to the quarantine requirements for those traveling to Fiji and for their return from Fiji. Um, what is the quarantine requirement in place currently? So let me explain. It may not be very well known how closely we worked with the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Tourism, Tourism Fiji and um, other ministries and stakeholders to first to ensure that the industry could survive this crisis because nobody knew how long it was going to, to last. Then we needed to support um, the Ministry of Health's efforts to get the vaccination program throughout Fiji. You know, keep in mind that Fiji is 333 islands. So wherever there were populations uh, and many of them in uh, tourism hubs around the country, we supported their vaccination program to get vaccines out there. And eventually we worked together on the reopening framework. This has been a crisis that no one has had any experience with before anywhere in the world. So we knew that it could not be left to government to do this on their own, and the industry couldn't do it without the support for government. So the reopening framework has been a massive collaborative effort of the like I'm certain we haven't seen before here. And one thing we worked extremely hard on with the different ministries was that a quarantine requirement was never ever going to convince visitors to come to Fiji. So if you're coming to Fiji from what we call a travel partner country or green zone like Australia, New Zealand and the US, no quarantine is required. So to be clear, quarantine is only when you come in, you stay in your room for a specific period of time and you cannot leave your room ex except for escorted exercise. And it's called managed quarantine because there are border security people at the hotel that include security, Ministry of Health staff, they all monitor your stay. You can't have visitors. The meals are brought to your room so that you have minimum contact with anyone from outside until the required amount of time has passed. So for red zone countries, this quarantine time frame is 14 days. So red zone countries would include places like PNG, for instance. So this had been reduced to 10 days, but with the emergence of Omicron, the quarantine time frame was um, increased back to the original 14 days. And depending on where you're coming from, there may be further travel requirements so that you provide proof um, before you get your approval to come to Fiji. So, so working with, sorry, on. I was going to say the Ministry of Health has agreed to not have quarantine for visitors from travel partner countries or green zones. This includes Australia because vaccination levels in these countries are deemed high enough for travel between us to be considered safe. And in Fiji, we are 92% um, vaccinated. So that's 92% of the targeted adult population. And children 15 to 17 years have also been done. And this is now being rolled out uh, as the approval has just come through for 13 to 15 year olds to be vaccinated. So our vaccination levels are really high. They continue to rise. And I believe they're currently higher than in uh, Australia and New Zealand. So to come to Fiji, travelers need to provide a negative proof of a PCR test 72 prior, uh, hours prior to your trip. And they must stay, stay at a Care Fiji Commitment or CFC certified hotel for a minimum of three nights. On their second day or 48 hours after they've arrived into Fiji, the hotel arranges for a rapid antigen test and a negative result confirms that you can venture out even further. So during those first three days that visitors come to Fiji, you can go out to restaurants, you can take part in day trips, you can have family visit you at the hotel, you can move around freely, it is not quarantine. You can even go to Lombasa or Sabo Sabo or one of the other islands, so long as it's all within the CFC approved travel areas, and we constantly remind visitors to look for the CFC stickers to confirm that one, you are entering a highly vaccinated business that we've confirmed, and also that we know for a fact that they're practicing COVID safe guidelines that we have shared very widely across the industry. So only if you're coming from a non-travel partner country or a red zone, then only will you be required to quarantine and that's for 14 days. If you're coming from Australia, your first three nights have to be at a CFC certified hotel so that we in the hotel and tourism industry, we can confirm to the Ministry of Health that on your second day, you've returned a negative rapid antigen test. It costs around $150 Fijian for a PCR test, um, but if the testing provider, doctor or a private lab is coming out to your resort, swabbing the visitor, taking the sample to the lab and providing a printed result, 
you may pay higher than the $150 based on what your location is and how quickly the test is turned around. And we've also made walk-in options available in and around the airport area so that if you're traveling quickly or you're coming into Fiji for, you know, five days or less, uh, it is a lot easier for you to um, uh, access this service. So basically, the hotels have effectively been made responsible for visitors in their first three days or three nights in Fiji. They have to provide the test results back to the Border Health Protection Unit or the BHPU. And these people have a list of every arriving visitor. And these are basically check, uh, checked off. So if a visitor deliberately refuses to take the second day test or they haven't been able to find him or, you know, he ran away from the hotel, God forbid, um, he could find himself slapped with a $10,000 fine before he tries to leave. And we don't want this to happen. So the hotels constantly remind everybody, you need to take a swab on your second day and they will arrange for somebody to do this for you so that they can send that information back to the BHPU. Now, how long does this uh, three-day accommodation at uh, CFC uh, hotels last? So I guess the answer to that is that until the Ministry of Health determines that this an oversight, because that's what it is, it's an oversight that allows them to know where every arriving visitor is for the first three days with the support of the hotels is no longer required. And that may be when um, earlier, if we can introduce a system that basically books every visitor into a second day um, rapid antigen test somewhere without the need to be staying at a hotel. But until then, we're still working on this. Until then, it will probably be here in place for a few months. And with Omicron, I guess um, this added um, layer of, of protection and monitoring uh, probably was a good thing that um, it had been planned for uh, before we even heard of Omicron. So for the time being, it is in place and it will stay in place for the next few months. Okay, and uh, Fantasha, in uh, closing, what does the future hold for Fiji's tourism industry right now as we look at things uh, you know, from a global perspective, what does the future hold for Fiji's tourism industry? I guess, Soshi, how we come out of this um, COVID impacted first year, you know, uh, December going into December next year, will determine how we can build on our next phase of growth. Um, the numbers for our uh, December and January um, bookings have been very positive. Um, We've had over 30,000 booked for December and over 40,000 already booked in for January. And if you consider that these, you know, the end of December going into January and February are considered our traditional uh, low peaks where we get uh, a far less number of visitors. Uh, and that's, so that's been a very positive um, uh, fact for us to see that, you know, the numbers are still growing in terms of um, bookings. So tourism, it's always been a very resilient industry. We're constantly planning for the risks and the hard times so that we can meet any of these challenges. We've certainly never met anything like COVID before. Certainly never, never something that stretched out for so long that, you know, um, impacted everyone's uh, resources, cash flows, uh, and everyone had to dig really, really deep to stay, uh, to stay where they are. We do realize that we still have a lot of work to do to keep our staff, our visitors, our communities that we work very closely with uh, to keep everyone safe. But certainly we're looking at how do we build even more resilience going forward, because that's something that we have to uh, constantly keep at the back of our minds that um, these um, sudden wa these waves could continue to happen. We could get um, more virus, uh, virus variants. And we need to be planning for that. So how do we make sure that we are, you know, we're ready for it the next time? Fantasha Lockington, a big, big Vinaka Vakalevu to you for sharing your views this afternoon. It's been a delight talking to you. We wish you and uh, everyone in the tourism and the hotel sector the very best uh, for this year and for 2022. Thank you very much. Thank a big Vinaka Vakalevu. Vinaka. Thank you. More than, now, uh, that was Fantasha Lockington uh, giving us some uh, views regarding tourism. Let me assure you that uh, we're uh, trying to bring uh, Mr. Chaudhary back on uh, screen. Uh, we've had uh, some issues. Uh, uh, let's see if we can get him up. Uh, and uh, we're uh, trying, we, we can see a background, but uh, we'll be talking to Mr. Chaudhary hopefully in just a moment, and I certainly hope that uh, we can conclude uh, 
the rest of the questions that I had prepared, looking at electoral issues, looking at uh, a few very uh, uh, key concerns that people have as Fiji heads towards the 2022 elections, the uh, independence of the Supervisor of Elections Office, for instance, and also looking at uh, the Fiji Labour Party as to um, uh, what the party party's mood is uh, and what they hope uh, to achieve uh, as well. So um, in just a moment or so, we hope to have Mr. Chaudhry back on, uh, uh, on screen to be part of the continuation of the program. I'd like to thank all those people who've uh, stayed uh, on the program on SSTP this afternoon. Uh, many have left uh, soon after Mr. Chaudhry's feed dropped. Uh, to those of you still here on the program uh, with us, thank you very much. Uh, we are trying desperately to uh, get Mr. Chaudhry back on. There's some internet issues uh, uh, as well on the Fiji end, I think. Um, but we're trying. We're trying our best. Uh, let me assure you, I've got some key questions to ask uh, Mr. Chaudhry about uh, elections for 2022, the, the supervisor of elections uh, issues, and a number of other things as well. So please bear with us. I hope you can uh, continue to be part of this program. We'll let you know in just a moment uh, as to the status of uh, Mr. Chaudhry joining us again. Yes, indeed, you are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and uh, we are, believe you me, we are trying to uh, get Mr. Mahendra Chaudhry back on uh, the program, and uh, we thought we had him a little while ago, but uh, we didn't get the video image, uh, just the background image of the studio, but uh, we'll try to bring him online in the studio very shortly, and I certainly hope that we don't have to abort the interview with uh, Mr. Chaudhry. Looking ahead at next week, uh, next week's program, we have uh, former governor of the Reserve Bank of Fiji and uh, currently 
leader of the Fiji Unity Party, Mr. Savanada Narumbe, joining us to discuss uh, the new party and uh, also to discuss policies and uh, politics in general uh, from the eyes uh, of uh, Mr. Savanada Narumbe of the Fiji Unity Party. We will then take a break on Sashi Singh's talking point for the Christmas and New Year holidays and come back in the in the new year uh, sometime in late January, hopefully. So uh, we will keep you updated. And if you are one of those people who have uh, liked the Sashi Singh's Talking Point uh, Facebook page, then you'll obviously receive notifications uh, and uh, advice uh, as to when the program is going to resume in the new year. In the meanwhile, um, I'll give this perhaps another two or three minutes. Uh, if we can get Mr. Chothri, well and good. Uh, I certainly hope we can. Um, yes, yeah, some uh, interesting questions uh, remain to be asked. And if not, then uh, we'll just have to um, say goodbye for now and uh, give the gentleman an opportunity sometime in the future. So, uh, you know, hang in there and uh, let's just uh, keep our fingers crossed for the sake of... Uh, finishing this interview today. Now, Narish, uh, there's no conspiracy theory allowed in this program. <laughs> um, let's just hope uh, we get Mr. Chaudhary back uh, Anudas, it's so nice of you to say thank you to uh, Fantasha Lockington indeed uh, nice uh, also Anil Kumar says Vinaka Fantasha uh, lovely, I think we've got him have we, Vince? have we got Mr. Chaudhary? let's uh, let's just see uh, if we can put him on um. There we go. We, we could see the uh, internet thingy going round and round. Uh, so there seems to be a, a problem. Uh, uh, again, that problem still exists. Uh, Mr. Chaudhary is trying and uh, let's just see. And uh, in, a, in a spirit of balance, let me also tell you that uh, uh, and reaffirm that uh, I have uh, sent an invitation to the Attorney General's office to uh, invite uh, Mr. Kayum to be part of this uh, program or any of his uh, party's representative, the government's representative, uh, to take part in this program. So far, I have not uh, uh, had a response, uh, obviously. Um, government uh, is busy, running a government is hard work, but uh, I hope that in the new year there is some contact and uh, I'd love to have uh, one of those representatives, uh, if uh, the Prime Minister or the Attorney General can accept that invitation, we'd love to have them on uh, Sashi Singh's talking point. There's a lot of pertinent uh, uh, issues to be discussed and uh, it'll be uh, uh, good for uh, uh, us to lay out issues that can be discussed openly because this program has uh, started uh, as a means to facilitating dialogue, to facilitating uh, uh, matters of interest, to uh, facilitating issues for discussion that perhaps uh, uh, sometimes in some places cannot be discussed. So, uh, again, as I say, I do apologize on behalf of Mr. Chaudhary and on behalf of Sashi Singh's talking point. Uh, we just seem to be having a problem. Mukesh Chand writes, deliberate attempt to silence uh, Mr. Chaudhary. Well, uh, let's not uh, fall back on conspiracy theories, Mukesh. Uh, um, 
Umesh Chandra writes, Chaudhary can be strong opposition than the current ones. Well, Mr. Chaudhary will have to win the elections to uh, enter parliament to be an opposition, uh, one would imagine. Uh, uh, so let's uh, see what happens with that. And um, let me see if I can uh, just to try and phone Mr. Chaudhary and see what's going on and then make a decision uh, on the rest of the program for this afternoon. I've uh, just uh, phoned Mr. Chaudhry and I've spoken with Mr. Chaudhry. He's back on. Let's not waste any more time, Vince, and uh, let's get Mr. Chaudhry straight back on. Uh, Mr. Chaudhry, we... Okay, Mr. Chaudhry, Mr. Chaudhry, we've got you back on again. Um, hello, Mr. Chaudhry, we've got you back on again. Can you hear us now? All right, we're just trying to... Yes, indeed. Mr. Chaudhary, we've got you back on uh, as, as in terms of the video image. Can you hear us now? Yes, I can hear you quite clearly. All right. Well, I tell you, you have uh, some supporters uh, who have now yes, fallen can. back. Thank you. You have some supporters who've fallen on conspiracy theories. They are propagating the fact that you've deliberately been cut off. I don't want to go there. And uh, I'm so happy that you're back on uh, Sashi Singh's talking point. Uh, welcome back, Mr. Chaudhary. Can you hear us now, Mr. Chaudhary? All good? Thank you very can much. You I'm sorry us? about this. But <laughs> no, that's okay. As long as yes. you can hear us. We can resume now. All right, good. Yes. Well, as I was saying, welcome back to the program. Yes, I can. Okay, my focus now um, turns to the office of yes, the I supervisor. Can hear you. All right, great. Okay, there seems to be a delay, I think, but we'll try to manage. Okay, my focus now turns to the office of the supervisor of elections. You have recently said that the supervisor of elections, Mohammed Sanim, has to go if Fiji is to have free and fair general elections in 2022. This is a very, very strong statement by you. First question, have you lost confidence in the Office of the Supervisor of Elections uh, and also in the Supervisor of Elections? Yes, indeed. Uh, we have been making representations uh, for some time now for his removal from office. And uh, I am not alone, or the Labour Party is not alone in this uh, particular case. Uh, all opposition parties have virtually uh, uh, made these uh, representations. We have sent joint letters to the Chairman of the Constitutional Offices Commission to uh, convene 
a tribunal to investigate uh, Mr. Sanim for misconduct and uh, also to remove him uh, based on the findings of the uh, tribunal. All right. Uh, so, so uh, go on. Yes, we've had this has been an issue uh, uh, is, uh, since 2014, actually. Now, the circumstances surrounding this, we need to go back to that. Mr. Sanim was appointed actually in 2014, just before the, the before the elections. He did not apply for the position because he did not have the minimum qualification requirements for the position as advertised. Uh, when the matter was taken up by the then commission, uh, of which uh, Mr. Chen Ban Yang was the chairman, uh, he was informed that uh, there were uh, uh, unsuitable applicants. Uh, and uh, so he was, uh, their advice then was to re-advertise the petition. But then suddenly, Mr. Sanim was appointed out of the blue, even though he did not qualify. So it begins from there. And of course, we also have information that he's related to uh, the Attorney General, who is also the Minister for Elections, and who is also the General Secretary of the Fiji First Party. So that appointment right from the beginning was not proper. He was appointed when he did not have the qualifications for the post. He did not apply for the post. He was appointed uh, without in my view, concurrence or consultation with the then Electoral Commission. Subsequent to his appointment, his actions have been viewed by the opposition parties as pro PG first. And uh, he has a bias against the uh, opposition parties. And this, is, uh, this has been borne out by the fact that uh, he has reported a number of uh, opposition politicians to FICAC for investigations. And in all these cases, these investigations uh, were led to prosecution of these people. And eventually, the cases against them were dismissed. So he has a habit of harassing uh, the uh, opposition politicians. And uh, This is the reason why, in 2018 even, elections, a similar call was made that uh, there is a general feeling amongst the opposition people here and also generally public at large that we will not be having free and fair elections as long as he remains in that position. And we, in our letter to the chairman of the Constitutional Officers Commission, who is the prime minister, we outlined, we detailed all the reasons why we were seeking the appointment of a tribunal. And uh, unfortunately, that letter was written in August. And to this day, it has neither been acknowledged nor responded to. They have just ignored that. This has forced us now, three political parties, that is the Fiji Labour Party, the Freedom Alliance Party, and the Unity Fiji Party, to take the matter to court. And uh, we are now taking illegal action because the Constitutional Officers Commission has not responded to our request for the appointment of a tribunal. We are now going to court, seeking the court to order the Constitutional Officers Commission to appoint a tribunal. Because this matter must be investigated. It's a question of elections, and we must have free and fair elections. There is ample uh, reason why a tribunal should be appointed, but the authorities are not acting on it. And of course, they have a vested interest in, uh, in Sunni, that that's for sure. They have a vested interest in him. They want him there. And this is why they are not uh, moving to have a tribunal or take any uh, administrative action as far as he is concerned. How, how soon do you think the courts will act on that? Well, I do not know how long it will take because we are now into the uh, legal vacation, this being uh, close to Christmas. But I believe our lawyers uh, uh, are have either filed or are ready to file the necessary papers uh, for uh, seeking uh, the court's uh, uh, intervention in the matter.
Mr. Chaudhry, recently, together with your two coalition partners, you questioned the integrity of the Legal Practitioners Unit regarding the office of the Electoral Commissioner and Chairperson, Mr. Suresh Chandra. Do you think the treatment meted out to Mr. Chandra was fair? Well, Mr. Chandra was allowed to uh, practice when his when he was under investigation for misuse or abuse of the trust fund of his law firm. For two years, he was granted a conditional practicing license whilst the investigations by the Legal Practitioners Unit uh, was underway on allegations of uh, uh, abuse of trust fund. This was uh, improper because if you are being investigated for uh, uh, for misuse of trust fund, uh, then uh, to be given a conditional license uh, is not proper. Uh, the license should be suspended. But this was not done. I think he was uh, granted a favor. On whose instructions, I wouldn't know. But from our, inf our in information is that uh, he uh, advised the uh, registrar of the legal practitioner's unit that he was dealing with the issues relating to his trust fund and he expected to have them settled. So uh, they allowed him to practice conditionally. When after two years, this was not resolved, this issue was not resolved, then they decided to suspend his practicing license. Now, when this occurred, of course, uh, it disqualified him to be the chairman of the Electoral Commission because the uh, Constitution requires the chairman to be either a judge or a person who's qualified for a judge. So if you do not have a practitioner certificate, you're disqualified. Now, we raised this, we, we, we wrote to the Constitutional Officers Commission, uh, and uh, the very next day, uh, Mr. Chandra announced his resignation out of the blue. He gave no reasons for it. There was no government statement on this. He simply moved out of office as if nothing had happened. Uh, we then wrote to the, uh, uh, the registrar, the head of the legal practitioners unit, about this, as to why he was given this special favor. And whilst this matter was under investigation, whether the attorney general, who was also the minister for elections, was notified of this because uh, it is the protocol, it is mandatory that the Attorney General be advised if any senior public official is under investigation uh, for any serious misconduct or, or, or matter which might bow down criminal conduct. So uh, we asked him whether he had done that. And we also asked him to explain why a uh, conditional practicing license was granted because this is normally not the practice. Was it granted to him on the instructions or directive of a senior official of the government, uh, or what? Uh, we have not received a reply to that either. They have not replied to it. We have uh, sent them a follow-up letter just uh, last Friday to, to uh, say to them, look, uh, you are accountable to the people, no matter who you are, you are a public officer, and you owe these explanations. Because what you have done, according to us, is improper. It's not proper conduct on your part. And you need to explain this. It's not that you are sitting in a high chair somewhere and uh, you, you uh, are not accountable to the people. This had, this had become the habit under the Bani Marama government where they simply ignore any representations made to them, any calls for them to explain a proper decision or action of the government. They simply ignore these things. Now we've got to bring them to the table. They must answer to the people. They must be held accountable. They must be made accountable. And we're going to follow this, uh, this course of action uh, from here on, because I think in, uh, in some ways, uh, maybe the opposition should have done this all along, uh, but they did not. They did not go the full distance. They might have questioned that decision or action initially, but they did not follow through. And I think we need to do that so that we can hold them accountable, particularly when elections are coming so near. Now... In any appointment, uh, particularly 
if we're looking at it, in an appointment for the position of the electoral commissioner, there are regulatory bodies that oversee the appointment and credentials of such appointees. Uh, you've just given us the example of uh, practicing certificate and uh, uh, things like that. Would you agree that there is an obvious questionable silence on the part of the regulatory bodies in this example of Mr. Suresh Chandra, for instance? Yes, indeed. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> let me tell you why. Because the Constitutional Officers Commission, which under the Constitution is responsible for recommending uh, to the President the appointment of uh, independent constitutional officers. The chairman of that commission is the Prime Minister himself. <laughs> and then there are three other government members. The Tony General is one of them. Uh, and uh, so there are four government members in that commission and two members of the leader of the opposition. Now, this in itself is wrong because it should be an independent commission, independent of the government. Here, the government itself is appointing, more or less. Uh, there are four members in the commission, so naturally, whoever they nominate uh, to the president will be appointed. So there is no uh, separation of more or less powers here when the of appointments to independent constitutional officers are made, it should be made by people who are independent of the government, as was the case under the 1997 constitution. We had a constitutional officers commission too, but it was quite independent. No politician was a member of that commission. Here, it's quite different. But this is a provision in the 2013 constitution, which was written by the Bani Marama government and uh, imposed on the people of Fiji. So uh, we can't expect much uh, from that, I think this is a provision which needs to be looked at seriously. If this is not amended, they'll continue to appoint people who are their own uh, 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 affiliates or, or supporters to such petitions. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point and our chief guest this afternoon is Mr. Mahendra Chaudhary, former Fiji Prime Minister and leader of the Fiji Labour Party. Now, Mr. Chaudhary, let me ask you about your own Fiji Labour Party. You are now back at the helm as the Labour Party leader. How do you gauge the support for the party these days? What is the mood in the electorate for the Fiji Labour Party? Thank you, Sashi, for, for that question. Uh, yes, uh, we have, we've been away from Parliament. We haven't been there for the last eight years uh, since... Uh, elections resumed after the uh, a period of eight years uh, without a parliament. Uh, so in the interim, uh, uh, a lot of party structures uh, had uh, become dormant. And uh, these, we, are we are in the process of reviving these structures, uh, uh, rebuilding the party. Uh, we have done... Uh, uh, some work on this, but then we have been uh, uh, rather hampered by the restrictions placed on uh, the movement uh, of people uh, and on meetings and things like that under the COVID protocol. Uh, so uh, uh, we've had a bit of a setback there, but nonetheless, uh, we have done whatever we could. Uh, our old supporters uh, who had left us uh, are eager to come back to the party. Wherever we've been, we've seen that there is support coming back. So we're encouraged by that. But of course, we have uh, some distance to go. And uh, as soon as uh, the restrictions are removed, it is possible to have uh, meetings uh, and gatherings uh, without permits and things like that. Uh, we will be in full force. But I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we will uh, uh, make good comeback in the 2022 elections. Now, recently it was said by your party that, uh, and I quote, Labour has the vision and determination to recreate a robust economy to benefit all. We've discussed economy at another level, but on this one that Labour has the vision and determination to recreate a robust economy to benefit all, how will you achieve this? Well, let me, uh, let me say that 
that uh, we governed for a year in 1999-2000. Uh, and that record, that record of one year is unparalleled by subsequent governments, even governments before then. We were able to muster in a economic growth of 9.6%, which uh, is, uh, has not been matched so far. And uh, during our time, the government revenues, we took over from Mr. Ambuka. Uh, government revenues were the highest ever. The expenditure was well within the budget. We never had budget overruns like what, what we have now or uh, during Mr. Ngarza's time. Uh, we had a surplus in the operating account. We lived to our promise to the electorate in our manifesto. We brought down the cost of living by removing VAT on basic food items. We told them that we were going to lower the interest rates uh, on housing uh, loans for the lower paid uh, uh, families, lower, lower, lower income families. And we brought them down from 11% uh, to 6%. We reduce duty on most food items. And uh, so the economy was doing well. Uh, the tourism numbers were going up. Uh, sugar production had jumped from 2.8 million tons of cane to almost 4 million tons of cane. We had a drought in 1999. We embarked on a uh, rehabilitation, cane rehabilitation project, uh, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, that, that paid dividends. Uh, so uh, that, that helped us to get, get that kind of a growth. There was a resurgence of confidence in the country. The 1997 constitution uh, was there. An elected government was in place for the first time. Uh, a person of Indo-Fijian descent was the prime minister. And people thought that, all right, this is good, because now there will be stability and uh, there will be uh, the multiracialism uh, uh, and uh, all these values uh, that we had been talking about will be put into practice. So uh, this helped us a lot also. And we did it. But then, uh, you know, we were not allowed to carry on after 12 months. Uh, we had another coup. And uh, we all know that's history. But we all know what happened after that. We all know what happened after that. And I had spoken about this earlier, the effect of coups on the economy of a country, on its people uh, generally. So uh, yes, we have the vision. Uh, we can do the job as we have uh, shown in the past, although it may have been for 12 months. But I can tell you that had we been given the full five years, Fiji would have been a different place today. Yeah. A lot of people are talking no. about you know, Singapore, the Pacific. But uh, no, it can be done, but uh, it needs a good government. It needs a, a, a government with ideas, with innovation. And above all, it needs a clean and caring government, government which is uh, uh, attuned to the people, which uh, manages the economy and government finances prudently. Fiji has a lot of potential as a nation. Uh, it can be uh, a very rich country. There is, no re there is no reason why we are a poor country. We are into the 51st year of our independence. And you tell me. You were once living in Fiji, you know. But yes. I, when I think back, when I reflect back, I think I was better off 25 years ago. Life was much better off. Now, there was not so much poverty as, as today. There was not so much tension, social stress, and the things that we have today, you know. Uh, a lot, lot of things that have that have crept in with time, uh, like uh, drug trafficking, pe people's traffic, you know, people trafficking, yes. prostitution. All these things have come into this country. Even our borders were opened without uh, without thinking. We allowed all sorts of people to come in here, and then we see a surge in this kind of crime, which we never had before in the country. So. Uh, these are issues which uh, any government which comes in must look at, because I think a lot of uh, things that have happened in the last 15 years have not been for the good of the country. May have been for the good of some people, but overall it has not been good for the PCGP. Mr. Chaudhary, right at the beginning we discussed uh, 
challenges uh, that people in the country face. And we discuss socioeconomic challenges, etc. But uh, now from a political standpoint, what do you think is the greatest uh, challenge facing Fiji as it heads towards the elections? This is from a political standpoint. I know we've discussed uh, the Office of the Supervisor of Elections, but as we head to the 2022 elections, what is the greatest challenge from a political standpoint? Well, I think the greatest challenge would be a smooth transition of power should the current government lose the election. There is some misapprehension about this in a lot of circles, but I, that is the challenge that's facing us, that should they lose, will they give up power peacefully? Will there be a smooth transition of power? That is the challenge facing us. All right, and uh, I know, Mr. Chowdhury, we've had some glitches today. Uh, you've had other commitments that you've told me previously. I really thank you for uh, taking that additional time out of your very busy schedule to be part of this program. In conclusion, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is your message to the electorate? Uh, we're in uh, December 2021. Elections uh, are supposed to be held in 2022. What's your message to the electorate today? I have a couple of messages. First is, uh, I would urge all those who are eligible to vote to register if they have not registered. And if you've registered, make sure that on the day you vote. And this also applies to all those uh, who are now residing abroad and who are qualified to vote, who are registered to vote. They should also register and they should also exercise their vote on the due day. Uh, don't waste your vote because Fiji is right now at a crossroads. And this election is very important for the future of Fiji. Which direction Fiji will go in, uh, uh, into after this election depend on uh, the results of this election. So I would urge all uh, those who are qualified to vote to please make sure that uh, you are eligible to vote, you're registered, and do come and vote on the day uh, of the voting. The second message is, choose wisely. You have before you a number of parties who are all becoming with their own message to you. All will be uh, seeking your vote. Uh, you choose wisely. We have a record uh, uh, or history of, uh, of uh, forming governments or voting based on ethnicity. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that must change. The days of voting on ethnicity or promises made by political parties must change and they must be judged on their record. Uh, if they have been in government before, you must judge them on the record in government. If they have not been in government, then you must judge them on the record uh, as, a, as a political party and in any other uh, uh, capacity uh, in the public life. But it is important that the choice they make must be for the, uh, for the good of all and particularly for the nation as a whole. As I said, we are at the a crossroads and we need to take the right direction here on otherwise uh, you know it will be a tragedy right now i'm very concerned about the future of our young men and women we've talked about unemployment we talked about the de deteriorating state of the economy we've talked about social indicators and all these sort of things these are not good news good news good news for the people we are losing people who are leaving, who seem to have uh, become frustrated that nothing is happening here. Things are not improving. And I cannot simply sit back here and uh, give away my future. So we are losing people who are uh, uh, needed here for our own development. But uh, if uh, things don't change, then one cannot blame them either for seeking a future uh, for, the, uh, for, their own, for themselves and for their children, which will secure them. 
So that's those are two things are my my message to the principals. And I thank you uh, for uh, inviting me to this problem. I'm sorry about the glitches we've had. I'll make sure next time uh, things are all in place and working perfectly. Uh, and uh, before I uh, I go, uh, I uh, know that you had uh, Miss Lockington just before uh, just a while ago. Uh, yes. My uh, request to uh, people, particularly in Australia, would be uh, do visit us. We need you to come here to fill up our hotels. We are broke. <laughs> you can help our economy. Please, if you are contemplating a holiday, do come to Fiji. You know that Fiji has a very good reputation, good hospitality, and all that. You won't be disappointed. So that's my last message. Thank you well very said, much Mr. for having me on well the program. Well said, Mr. Choudhury. Mr. Mahendra Choudhury, I thank you for your time today, especially being a Sunday, a Sunday afternoon, and uh, noting fully well that uh, you have a number of commitments as well. I take this opportunity in wishing you and your Fiji Labour Party officials and supporters all the very best as you head to the elections in 2022. And at this juncture, I'd like to extend to you, Mr. Choudhury, and to your party uh, delegates, uh, representatives, an open invitation in 2022 to be part of Sashi Singh's talking point, to raise matters of interest, to raise matters for discussion, that the people of Fiji people worldwide who have an interest in Fiji could participate in and uh, could hear, so to say, from the horse's mouth. So that's an open invitation to you, sir. Thank you so much. We'll make thank sure you. we make use of that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chaudhry, and uh, goodbye for now. We look forward to talking to you uh, in, in the new year, as I said. Thank you very much indeed. Well, Sashi Singh's Talking Point, you are watching from no, Sydney, Australia. Lovely. Thank you. You're welcome. I must state that I have indicated, and I say this again, uh, an invitation to the Attorney General's office to seek that uh, he accepts our invitation to take part in an interview session, and I hope that uh, he can accept that in invitation. So it's a balanced uh, presentation of uh, a program. I've had uh, uh, Mr. Chowdhury today, Last week, I had the leader of the National Federation Party, and uh, I'd like to balance things out uh, and invite uh, somebody from the Fiji First Party to come forward and uh, take part in a discussion with me about things pertaining to Fiji and uh, whether or not they agree with uh, matters that have been raised by the other two political leaders uh, in the last two weeks, including today. So there you have it. That's our program for today. But next week, I'm looking forward to having a chat with uh, the former governor of the Reserve Bank of Fiji and uh, the leader of the Fiji Unity Party, Mr. Savanada Narumbe. That's uh, a program that I'm really excited about, uh, to talk to a gentleman who was a former banker and now a politician. And uh, that's going to make for an interesting program at all, altogether. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Fantasha Lockington for being part uh, of today's program. A great insight there on uh, tourism and the hotel industry. I again thank Mr. Mahendra Pal Chaudhry for taking part in this program this afternoon. And uh, to Nick Hill Singh. Once again, Nick Hill, you've done a fantastic job with uh, things around Australia. Nick Hill, you were lucky I didn't ask you about the robocalls uh, from uh, one political candidate who's now come to my electorate. We'll talk about that next week. And uh, look, uh, Dennis Rounds is safely in the UK, and hopefully in the new year we'll catch up with Mr. Rounds and uh, get his contribution to the program as well. So today, Sunday, December the 12th, thank you very much for your participation in uh, Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Due to the glitches we've had, it's a slightly longer program, but I thank Mr. Chaudhry for his tenacity and for hanging in there so we could complete the program uh, with the questions I've had with him. So till next week, this is Sashi Singh from Sydney, Australia, wishing you all a very, very pleasant day. Stay well, stay blessed. From Sydney, Australia, it's goodbye, namaste, and nisa mothe.